Hello friends, you're watching 3ABN Sabbath School panel and we're making our way through our study on life everlasting, death dying and the future hope. We're taking on the topic of the state of the dead, the afterlife. We're clarifying it. What does the Bible teach about this subject? And we're glad that you are joining us. Thank you so much uh, for your love, prayers, and support of 3ABN. Uh, for without you, we wouldn't be here. And we love the Sabbath School panel. We love to study the Word of God together. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to take this time to introduce my friends, my family here on the panel. To my direct <laughs> left, we have Ms. Shelley Quinn. It's always a blessing to have you, sister. Thank you. It's a blessing to be here. I have Monday's lesson, He is Risen. Mm. Amen. Of course, to your left is Pastor James Rafferty. Good to be here, Ryan. I have Tuesday's lesson, Many Arose with Him. All right, all right. And of course, down the table there, we have Miss Jill Morricone. Glad to be here, Ryan. I have Wednesday, Witnesses of the Risen Christ. Amen. And of course, Pastor John Dinsey is at the end there on Thursday's lesson. What do you got, brother? It's a blessing to be here. I have the first fruits of those who have died. Aha. Uh -huh. All right. Praise the Lord. We're getting deeper as we go along. We're getting deeper. And so we're starting to get into some, I mean, it's all been great, but I think we're getting into some of those uh, texts and some of those things uh, that uh, people have questions about. And so this week, lesson number seven entitled Christ's Victory Over Death. But before we get right into our study, let's have a prayer. And I'm going to ask Ms. Jill Morcone if you have a prayer for us. Holy Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus and we're grateful for the death and the resurrection of Jesus. What, a, what hope we have as Christians because he rose from the dead. And we just ask right now for the anointing of your Holy Spirit that you would open our minds and hearts. Give us ears to hear what you have for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm. Amen. 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 Our memory text comes from Revelation chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. I love this text, one of my favorites. It says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And it goes on to say, and have the keys of Hades and of death or mm. of the grave and death. Praise the Lord for that Amen. statement. Praise the Lord for who Christ is. And we're going to learn more about that this week. I just want to give a simple overview. And I, I like to, usually when I host a 3B and Sabbath School panel, I like to take a little bit of time to uh, allow the author's words to come through, at least in a Sabbath afternoon study. So our Sabbath afternoon study here, I think he worded this very well to set us up for what we're going to be studying this week. And he says here, central to the Christian faith is the resurrection of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Paul made this point very powerfully when he wrote, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. That comes from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 16 through 18. It says, thus, no matter all the emphasis Paul put on Christ's death and how important it was, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Of course, that comes from 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2. It goes on to say, it really does us no good apart from His resurrection. That's how crucial the resurrection of Jesus is to the entire Christian faith and the plan of salvation. However, it's hard to understand why the resurrection of Christ and with it our resurrection are so important if, as many believe, the dead in Christ are already enjoying the bliss of heaven as they have gone home to be with the Lord. That seems to be a very, very dominant popular belief today in the Christian world. Uh, but we know the Bible says otherwise, and we're going to make that very clear as we continue on in our study. That sets us up for Sunday's lesson, which is entitled, A Sealed Tomb. Mm. And I really enjoyed this lesson because it, it kind of brings out the fact that it was the devil's plan. He did everything he could to make sure that Jesus stayed, remained mm -hmm. dead and sealed in that tomb. So let's consider the events Very leading funny. up to this. Christ is, is conducting the Last Supper there, right? We're just a few hours before we're into Passover. But Christ is, is conducting the Passover. And in the midst of this dinner, this, this gathering with his disciples, he says, says, one of you are going to betray me. And it's the one that I'm going to give a piece of bread to, right? And of course, we know that to be Judas. And the scripture says in Luke chapter 22, verse 3 and 4, again, that's Luke 22, verse 3 and 4. It says, then Satan entered Judas, mm. surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the 12. So he sent, or he, excuse me, he went his way and conferred with one of the priests and captains how he might 
betray him to them. Mm. And so we know Judas goes on. He leaves because Christ says, what you do, do quickly. Mm -hmm. You know the story. He goes on. He meets with the Pharisees. And that night he planned to reveal the location of where Christ was going to be. As we know, Jesus and his disciples would go on to Gethsemane. Mm. And there Christ would be resurrected. Excuse me. He would be arrested yeah. uh, uh, because Judas basically turned him over and betrayed him. And of course, we also read how the disciples, during all of this process, the disciples forsook Jesus. We read this in Matthew chapter 26, verse 56. It says, but all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Mm. So they arrest Jesus. Now they're going to take him on to the trial. And, you know, Peter lingers and follows behind from a distance. But during the midst of this trial, we learn that Peter denies he, just a few hours before he said, oh, no, Lord, I'm not going to deny you ever. But then Jesus says, no, this very night you will deny me three times. And that happened. You can read about that in Matthew chapter 26, verses 69 through 75. Mm. But then in the midst of this trial, we learn that the Pharisees, the devil is working through the Pharisees to shut Jesus down. And we see, we read about this in Matthew chapter 26, verse 59. It says, Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death. Mm. Mm. And then Matthew, tie that with Matthew 27, verse 20. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. So mm. notice everything is focused on killing Jesus, destroying mm -hmm. Jesus. And then, of course, Jesus eventually is taken out to Golgotha's hill. Mm. He's hung up on a cross in which he will give his life and he will die. Today, we say, praise God for that death. Mm. Praise God for what Christ has done for us on the cross of Calvary. Mm. For if it wasn't for the cross, where would we be? Yeah, mm. right. But oftentimes we do, and, I, and we have to put a proper balance here, and this is what the lesson brings out. Oftentimes we put so much emphasis on the death, and praise God for that death. Praise God for the penalty He took for me and you mm. so that you and I might live. But if there was not a resurrection... Mm none of that would have been, Amen. all of it would have been void. None of it yeah. would have mattered mm -hmm. if Christ had not come from that sealed tomb. Christ actually foretold his resurrection multiple times in, in the scriptures. In fact, I'm gonna, I have some text here that I want you guys to read. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I have James reading Matthew chapter 12, verse 39 and 40. James, could you read Matthew 12, verse 39 and 40 for us? Sure, but he answered and said unto them, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Absolutely. And so we understand the, the concept of inclusive reckoning comes into account when we're studying these, you know, these three days and three nights. But nonetheless, mm -hmm. this text proves to us that you know, Christ mm -hmm. very, very clearly predicted that he would be in the tomb. He predicted his resurrection as well. So notice here, Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. I believe, Jill, you have that okay. one. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. 21. Read that for us. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. So there it is again. And by the way, all of these uh, that I'm giving is from Matthew to show that these are different accounts that multiple times Christ predicted his resurrection. Uh, so the, uh, on the third day, <clears throat> now let's go on to Miss Shelley Quinn, Matthew chapter 17, verse 22 and 23. 17, 22, and 23. Now, while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. Mm. Mm. So the third day, again, he will be raised up, Christ mm -hmm. predicting mm -hmm. his resurrection. And then lastly, Matthew chapter 20, verse 17 through 19. Pastor Danzi, if you could read that for us. Now Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the 12 disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify, and the third day he will rise again. Mm. Mm. Okay, so Christ is making these statements 
publicly. I mean, he's saying this among people. He's letting them know, mm -hmm. yes, I will be killed, but I also will be resurrected the third day. The Pharisees were very much aware of these statements. They had heard of these statements. They were aware of the, that this, this message of Christ <coughs> was spreading throughout the land. And well, they were going to be doing everything that they could to make sure that they prevented that resurrection. In fact, we see uh, the plans laid out here in Matthew chapter 27. If you read verses 62 through 66, we see this very clearly. So Matthew chapter 27, verses 62 to 66. Notice what the scripture says here. It says, On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priest and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive, how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, He has risen from the dead, so that the last deception will be worse than the first. And then, of course, Pilate says to them, You have a guard. Go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. So you can see that the devil has clearly put in plans. He knows that while Christ has died and while he somewhat feels like he's won the victory already, in the back of the devil's mind, wait a second, Jesus said on the third day that he was going to resurrect. And so he's working through these Pharisees to make sure that Jesus would not resurrect. And it's, it goes to show you, that's, I think that in and of itself is a testament to the power of the resurrection of Christ. We're going to emphasize this more we go through the study in regards to how Christ overcame death through this resurrection. But my friends, it is absolutely imperative that we understand that without the resurrection of Christ, that there would be still no hope for us, for we would remain, as the scripture says, in our sins. We do not gain the victory just through his death, but also his resurrection. Amen. Ellen G. White, Manuscripts Released, Volume 12, page 412. This was brought out in the lesson. It says, if he could, he, Satan, would have held Christ locked in the tomb. That was his plan. If he could make it happen, he was going to do everything he could to make sure that Christ was locked into that tomb. And uh, I had another uh, quote that I was going to read, but I don't have enough time. But there is one from the Desire of Ages, page 782. It says, when Jesus was laid in the grave, Satan triumphed. He dared to hope that the Savior would not take up his life again. He claimed that the Lord's, he claimed the Lord's body and set his guard about the tomb, seeking to hold Christ a prisoner. He was bitterly angry when his angels fled at the approach of the heavenly messengers. When he saw Christ come forth in triumph, he knew that his kingdom would have an end and that he must finally die. Now, that that's, a pow that's the power of the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Brother Ryan, that was wonderful. Thank you so Thank you. much. I'm Shelley Quinn, and I have Monday's lesson, three beautiful words. He is risen. Amen. Amen. One of my favorite gospels is the gospel of Luke. You know why? Luke was a Gentile mm -hmm. writing mm -hmm. to a Gentile, and he had some details that sometimes the other gospel writers just assume because mm -hmm. they were Jewish. Mm -hmm. So Luke makes it very clear. He specifically mentions that Jesus was crucified on the preparation day. What day is that? In the Bible, the first five days of the week have no name. They're just first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day. But the sixth day is called the preparation day and the seventh is the Sabbath. So Luke tells us mm -hmm. he's going to mention the preparation day, the Sabbath, and the first day of the week in Luke 23, if you want to open to Luke chapter 23. Mm -hmm. Now, Christ was crucified on the preparation day, and mm -hmm. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus removed his body. They wrapped it in linen, and then they laid it in Joseph's tomb. Mm -hmm. It was hewn out of a rock. And some of the female disciples of Jesus were watching where he'd been laid. Now let's look at Luke 23. That day was the preparation. So that's the preparation mm -hmm. day. And the Sabbath drew near. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they 
rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. You know, it's interesting to me, think about these women have in abject horror, they saw his bruised mm -hmm. body right. on the cross. They so loved him and wanted mm. to anoint his body to prepare him. But they went back mm. and rested on the Sabbath in accordance to the commandment. What does that tell you? They'd been mm -hmm. walking with Jesus for That's three right. years, three and a half years, and they, Jesus never rescinded the Sabbath commandment. Now mm. Luke 24 verse one. Now on the first day of the week, so he's, he's buried or entombed on Friday, preparation day, they're resting on the Sabbath, so did Jesus. Mm -hmm. And on the first day of the week, I bet they didn't even sleep that Sabbath <laughs> night. Mm -hmm. I bet they were so excited to get out there and take care of him. It says, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. Mm -hmm. So there's no question what day he was crucified. There's mm -hmm. no question that he spent Sabbath in the grave. And there's no question he came up Sunday morning. So uh, Matthew 28 is where we're going to look at now. And this is kind of a repeat of this story. You know, the first day of the week is only mentioned eight times the first day of the week, right. mentioned eight times in the New Testament. Five of those times all has to do with this Sunday morning. Yes. So Matthew 28, verse one, it says, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, so this would be Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. So they're bringing their spices to anoint his body. This was customary for your dead loved ones. And behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and the cloth his clothing was as white as snow and the guards shook mm. for fear of him, just mm. that, seeing right. an angel, mm -hmm. and became like <clears throat> dead men. <laughs> but the angel answered and said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. Mm -hmm. And he said, come see where the place where the Lord lay. Now, this is interesting. Mm. When they look into the tomb, you know what they find? <clears throat> they find the linen cloths right. all folded up. Mm. <laughs> now, the reason I want to point this out is because some people are going to try to start a rumor the, the religious leaders that somebody stole his body. Right. Let me ask you this, who would unwrap a dead body mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. steal it Just, and <laughs> leave the linen cloth? Yes. <laughs> Fold it up. Fold it up. Yeah. So he is risen. These words of victory have echoed throughout the centuries and the, uh, our study guide says, the victory of Christ over Satan and his evil powers was secured on the cross and confirmed by the empty tomb. So who was directly involved in raising Jesus from the dead? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I hear people say, oh, there's a contradiction in the Bible. We're going to look. John 20 verses 17 through 18, Jesus says, John 10, John 10 verses mm -hmm. 17 through 18, Jesus says, Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. This command I've received from my father. That's covenantal language right mm -hmm. there. If you have ever noticed in Exodus, God calls Israel his firstborn son. Yeah. He says, you are begotten, uh, in Deuteronomy, uh, Moses says, you are begotten. He is your father. This is covenant language. Yeah. And it's mirrored in the relationship with Jesus. 
He is God. Mm -hmm. He came down and in the person of Jesus Christ, he became the Son of God, the covenant Son of God. Mm -hmm. The begotten means to be chosen for a covenant purpose. Mm -hmm. So Romans 1 and verse 1, we'll begin there. Romans 1, 1, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Mm -hmm. The gospel is the everlasting covenant. It was announced in Genesis as soon as there was sin, and then God just all through the Old Testament and into the New. God is repeat and enlarge, repeat mm -hmm. and enlarge. He's building this gospel message. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Even in Exodus, the Old Covenant did not do away with the everlasting gospel of righteousness by faith. God just layered it over because it begins in Exodus and it mm. says, God hears them groaning. He remembers his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and with Jacob. And it just keeps going. And Luke tells us the same mm -hmm. thing for the New Testament. Mm -hmm. So the New Covenant. So it says, uh, which he promised before through the prophets and the holy scriptures mm. concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. He came, mm -hmm. he took on our flesh to pay our penalty yeah. for sin. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you, the everlasting covenant isn't just justification by faith. Mm -hmm. It is also sanctification by mm -hmm. faith. And Jesus' life is credited, all of his obedience right. is credited to, it, credited to us mm -hmm. to help us get rid of that death penalty. But then he works in us to will and to do his good pleasure. So although Christ, this says here, he became a human, why? First of all, to represent us as the representative of mankind. He had to be a human who fulfilled mm -hmm. all of God's Ten Commandments. He had to be a perfect human. But God couldn't die, so he had to take on flesh mm. so that he could die. Now, I've got one more point real quick. I didn't realize. It also, Romans 8, 11 says it was the Spirit who raised him up. Hebrews 13, 20 says it is the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus. Mm. So in this glorious event, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, one God, God, the Father, Son, and Spirit, one times one times one equals one. They all participated and Jesus is risen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Three words. He is risen. I love that. Mm. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 Avian Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3AVNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Hello, friends. Welcome back to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We are going to transition now to Pastor James Rafferty for Tuesday's lesson. I have Tuesday's lesson, and it is entitled, Many Arose With Him, and it is an exciting lesson. It is based in Matthew chapter 27, verses 51 to 53. So let's just take a look at these verses and see what we can find. Matthew chapter 27 begins with verse 51. Then, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked, the rocks were split, the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints. I'm just going to say that one more time. Many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming up out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now, 
there's an incredible account here that teaches us something significant about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what it accomplished. One of the things it teaches us is that not only was Jesus resurrected, but there were many saints that were resurrected with him, resurrected when he was resurrected. Now we know the context of these verses is talking about uh, the earthquake that took place, you know, when Christ died, when he's crucified. But the author here, Matthew, is looking back on the whole event and he's basically saying, you know, as this took place, as this earthquake took place, as Jesus died, when he was resurrected, there were many saints that were resurrected with him. Mm -hmm. And these saints went into the city and they made, they gave a witness, they gave a testimony yes. uh, for Jesus. Right. And, I, and I think about sometimes these verses, I've read them many times and I think, I wonder who those saints were. Right. <laughs> I wonder who was part of that. Well, who yeah. was that? I think some of the people <laughs> may have been people that had to be recognized by those that they witnessed to because they're going in to witness and, and, but I think some of them would just like, because you know, even when the scribes and Pharisees said to, to John the Baptist, are you Elijah? You know, are you this prophet? Are you that prophet? I'm just wondering, was there, was Elisha in there? Was Je Joseph, yeah, not Joseph, um, Joshua in there? Was Isaiah in there? Who were part of that group? Well, the thing though that I think the lesson brings out here is that Jesus took with him uh, a multitude of captives. Mm -hmm. those that were in the prison house of death. Mm -hmm. I love the way Ephesians shares this in Ephesians mm -hmm. chapter 4 and verse 8. It talks about this multitude of captives, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 8. And it says here, uh, Wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, this is when Jesus is, is going to heaven, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts unto men. Uh, he led those that were captive or, or in the prison house of death. He led them to heaven and he went there to give gifts unto men. So he's presenting this group of people who have been witnessing for him probably for about 40 days, I'm thinking, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. Christ was on the earth yeah. for 40 days. And, <laughs> and he's meeting with the disciples and he's on the road to Emmaus and he's meeting with, you know, his the ladies and those that were following him. And then these other doesn't say there were 20 of them or 30 of them or 40 of them or 100. We don't know how many there were until we get to Revelation chapter 4. All right. Uh, but there was a group of them and they were probably out. Who knows where they were out, right? They were going to all different places. Now, the reason I kind of mentioned Revelation chapter uh, 4 is because we see this incredible picture of a group of people that are in the throne room of God that have never been there before. I want us to think about this. This is really uh, amazing because the book of Revelation is a summation of the whole Bible. In the book of Revelation, the entire Bible meets, meets and ends, okay? Mm -hmm. So Revelation is not just like this new book that has all these things that we've never seen before. The only way you can really understand the book of Revelation is to go back to the rest of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Every symbol is explained by the rest of Scripture. And so Revelation is kind of distilling down into this one final message, the whole message of the book of Revelation. That's why it's called the revelation of Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ, because the whole Bible is about Jesus, right. right? And in the book of Revelation, you have this throne scene, it's not unique to the book of Revelation. The throne scene that you see in Revelation chapter 4 has already been seen in Daniel chapter 7. It's already been seen in Isaiah chapter 6. It's already been seen in Ezekiel chapter 1. And it's a, a throne room scene where there's the, the throne, there's this God, this majestic being, this light, there's this, these wheels within these wheels, um, there's a seat set up, there's thousands and thousands and 10,000 times 10,000 of angels that describe, you know, with these, with these various features like a man and a calf and an eagle and they have, you know, they have, some of them have six wings, they're, they're called cherubim and in various places they're described like Isaiah chapter 6. But there's one thing that we find in Revelation chapter 4 that is not in Isaiah chapter 6. It's not in hmm. Daniel chapter 7. It's not in Ezekiel chapter 1. You know what it is? It's the 24 elders. It's the 24 elders. And you're thinking, where did these 24 elders come? Now, some people have said, well, these 24 elders, they're representatives of other, you know, worlds or whatever. But, you know, they're still not in Daniel chapter 7. They're still not in Isaiah chapter 6. They're still not in any of the previous mm -hmm. throne room scenes. They're not there until you get to Revelation chapter 4. Right. This is what I love. Let's just look in Revelation chapter 4. Because the Bible tells us 
quite clearly that elders, and that's what they're called in Revelation chapter 4. Let's just read a couple of the verses here. Revelation chapter 4, and we'll start with verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard, which is, was as it were of a trumpet, that's the voice of Christ, talked with me, which said, Come up thither, and I will show these things which must be hereafter. And immediately as I was in the Spirit, so I'm seeing a vision here, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one who sat on the throne and he was like, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone and there was a rainbow around the throne and sight like under an emerald. And around about the throne were four and twenty seats and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed with white raiment. They had on their heads crowns of gold and then it goes on to describe what's coming out of the throne. Now, what I love about this picture is the connection it makes with the redeemed. Now we know that yeah. this is a picture of the redeemed for s several reasons. One of the reasons is the Bible tells us. If you just fast forward to Revelation chapter 5 and go down to verse 8, the Bible actually tells us who these angels are. It says in verse 8 of chapter 5, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And let's just read verse 10. And has made us unto our gods our God, kings and priests, mm. and we shall reign on the earth. Clearly, this is talking about the redeemed who've been promised positions of kingship and priesthood who are going to reign upon the earth. We will inherit the earth. Also, they have crowns, they have robes, yeah. and they sit on thrones. Those are the very things that are promised to those who overcome yes. in the seven churches. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And this is a group that's never been seen before. And this is what I love about it because further down in the book of Revelation, you find elders coming to John to give him explanations. Elders, not angels, elders. You're thinking, wow, God is actually, they didn't participate in the revelation of Jesus that he's giving to John. Mm -hmm. These elders come and they can, one of the elders says, uh, who's this great multitude that, that you saw around the throne? And John says, well, well, I don't know. Well, let me tell you who it is because you're going to want to know who it is because there's going to be some controversy about who this is. So let me explain to you who this great multitude is and how they came out of this great tribulation because I know about that. Mm -hmm. These elders, it's so cool, are really humans that in a sense represent us. God wants us to participate like they yes. participate Amen. in the revelation that is given. Yes. And so I love this picture. God is so exclusive, inclusive in this picture we see you know, John is writing 80, 90s, give or take. So he's looking back on the whole experience and God is showing him a vision that is all inclusive of what Christ has accomplished. And so first he says, Christ has accomplished the setting up of God's throne. It's set, it's established, it will not be moved. Mm -hmm. And the rainbows around the throne, God's mercy and justice established. And there's 24 elders there. You wonder how they got there? Keep looking. And there's a lamb that's slain in the midst of the throne. That's <laughs> how they got there. And when they got there, the Holy Spirit was there around the throne. But by that time the lamb is, is presented, you've got the Holy Spirit being sent out into all the world. Mm -hmm. It's this composite picture, this beautiful picture of Everything, well, I wouldn't say everything because the book of Revelation goes on to describe more, but so much of what Christ accomplished through his resurrection. So you love this picture that God gives to us in the book of Revelation. This picture is telling us that many arose with Christ. And those mm -hmm. many were representatives of the human family. Those many are saying, thank you for redeeming us out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And you can be with that group, with that many. You can be part of that group mm -hmm. who right now is working to give a revelation of Jesus Christ to the world. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor James. I love your knowledge of the Word and especially the book of Revelation. Amen. That was powerful. We could go a long while with that. And thank you, Shelly and Ryan. I'm Jill Morricone and I have Wednesday's lesson, Witnesses of the Risen Christ. Now, if Ryan had this lesson, maybe he would sing for you, but you all don't want me to do that. <laughs> so I want to quote this verse. I love this. They all walked away, nothing to say. They just lost their dearest friend. All that he said, now he was dead, so this was the way it would end. The dreams they had dreamed were not what they seemed, now that he was dead and gone. The garden, the jail, the hammer, the nail, how could the night seem so long? Then came the morning, mm. night turned into day. The stone was rolled away, hope rose with the dawn. Then came the morning, shadows vanished before the sun. 
Death had lost and life had won, for morning had come. My lesson on Wednesday, Witnesses of the Risen Christ. To me, I want to take an intimate look at what their journey would have been. Because can you imagine? I don't think anybody can imagine what it would have been like to be in their shoes, mm. to lose who they thought was the Messiah, to be confused and devastated. And then the morning came and Jesus arose and they saw him for the first time after the resurrection. We're going to walk chronologically through this and get through as many of these instances as we can. So the first instance is the woman. Witnesses of the risen Christ mm -hmm. is the woman. Right. We're going to John chapter 20. Now it's referenced Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but we're going to go to John chapter 20. This is Mary Magdalene at the tomb. Verse 11, Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. Verse 13, the angel is speaking. Woman, why are you weeping? Mm. And she said, they've taken my Lord. I don't know where they've laid him. Mm -hmm. The devastation of her hopes and dreams. Verse 14, when she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Mm. Have your eyes ever been so blinded mm. that you could not see clearly? Mm. Have your preconceived ideas ever prevented clarity mm. when the truth was standing right in front of you? Verse 15, Jesus said, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her one word, mm. Mary. Yes. Wow. And in that word, she instantly knew her Savior. The woman's yeah. takeaway, this is the woman being the witness of the risen Christ. Jesus cared enough to bring comfort and answers himself. Mm -hmm. You know, he could have given her a Bible study. Mm. He could have given the answers through the word mm. or someone else's testimony. Mm. He cared enough to show up right there physically with mm. his presence and he revealed himself through a single word. Let's look next at the disciples on the way to Emmaus. Same day, resurrection day, but it's in the afternoon. We're going to Luke 24. Luke 24, two disciples left Jerusalem heading to Emmaus. And in verse, Jesus shows up, but they don't recognize him again. And Jesus says, why are you sad? Mm -hmm. And then in verse 27, what does Jesus do? He gives a Bible study. Mm -hmm. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. What's the Emmaus takeaway? Jesus sought to convey truth and comfort, in this case, through a Bible study. Mm -hmm. So we see different avenues, different ways that Jesus relates to people. It was through a Bible study. But not just that, because they still didn't know who he was until what happened? He sat at the table, he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and then their eyes were opened, it mm -hmm. says in verse 31. They knew him and he vanished from their sight. So we see not only the Bible study took place, but he personally interacted with them. Mm -hmm. And then their eyes were open. The witness number three is Simon Peter. Mm. We're in Luke 24, same chapter, just down to verse 33. The disciples going back to Jerusalem, so excited to share the news. They rose up that very hour, returned to Jerusalem. They found the 11 and those with them gathered together saying what? The Lord has risen and has appeared to mm. Simon. Now, Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to bounce back and forth between the Gospels and Paul's account in 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 3, he says, I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, that he was seen by Cephas, mm. that's Simon Peter, then by the twelve. The next group we see is the disciples. Now remember, we're going back to Luke 24. The two disciples on the way to Emmaus saw Jesus. They run back to Jerusalem. They're super excited to share the news. And they discover Jesus has already appeared to Peter. Mm -hmm. And then as they're talking, the disciples together, Jesus shows up. Mm -hmm. We're in verse 36. Now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst, said, peace be to you. But they were terrified and frightened, thought they'd seen a spirit. And he said, why are you troubled? Mm 
Mm. Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. The takeaway I get from the disciples is that Jesus invites us to experience him for ourselves. Amen. What did he say? Handle me. Look at me. Mm -hmm. Touch me. Mm -hmm. Find out. Experience mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. Reminds me of Psalm 34. Taste and see the Lord is good. Mm -hmm. Jesus yeah. invites us. Experience me. Mm -hmm. Find out who I am. Discover me for yourself. Let's look at, now we see the disciple Thomas joins. This is a week after Resurrection Day. We're going to John 20. Remember, Thomas wasn't there initially. So in John 20, this is one week. John 20, verse 26, after eight days, this is a week after Resurrection Day. The disciples were inside and Thomas is there. Jesus comes in, the doors were shut and he just appeared in the midst. And then he said to Thomas in verse 27, reach your finger here, look at my hands, reach your hand there, put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Jesus said, because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Mm. The takeaway from Thomas is Jesus will reveal himself to those whose faith is weak. Maybe it's not the first choice because blessed are those who believe even if they have not seen. Mm -hmm. And yet Jesus adjusts himself to our human frailties. He didn't enter into controversy with Thomas or he didn't reproach him. Mm -hmm. He simply revealed himself to the doubting person. Mm -hmm. Then we see the disciples by the sea. Now we don't know when this occurred. One chapter over, we're in John 21. The disciples by the sea, and they remember they fished all night and they hadn't caught anything. And then Jesus appears. And what does he say? Cast the, uh, the line, the net on the other side of the boat, and all of a sudden a big haul comes in. Mm -hmm. Jesus will use whatever means necessary to get our attention. Mm -hmm. That's right. They caught that. And then all of a sudden they said, it is the Lord. And then we see over 500 brethren at once. Mm. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6, we're going back to what Paul said. Remember, as we go there, in Mark 16, the angel had told the woman, go tell his disciples and Peter, he's going before you into Galilee. Mm. There you will see him as he said to you. But in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, it says, after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once of whom the greatest part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. Mm. You can see this with the Great Commission in Matthew 28. If you read Desire of Ages, chapter 86, you see this exposition of that whole discourse that Jesus had with the disciples there. Then, of course, he appeared to them at the Ascension. This is Acts chapter 1, mm -hmm. uh, there on Mount Olivet, when he ascends and he blessed them and he, the clouds, the cloud of angels, hid him from their sight. In addition, after he was resurrected and after he ascended, he appeared to Stephen, did he not? At his stoning in mm -hmm. Acts chapter 7. Now, of course, he's already in heaven, but Stephen said he saw Jesus at the right hand of the Father. Mm -hmm. He appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. And Paul references that in our verse in 1 Corinthians. He says, last of all, he was seen by me also mm -hmm. as by one born out of due time. And we also know he appeared to John on the Isle of Patmos. Mm -hmm. And you know what the best part is? He wants to appear to you and I Amen. today and he wants to walk with us. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Wonderful. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Well, we are now on Thursday. My name is John Dinsey and the title is The First Fruits of Those Who Have Died. And this is a, a concept that comes to us from the Old Testament. And we're going to go into... Exodus chapter 22, verse 29 to begin there. And it says, you shall not delay to offer the first of your ripe produce and your juices, the firstborn of your sons you shall give to me. Mm. Now, Exodus 23, verse 19, the first of the first fruits of thy land thou shalt bring into the house of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not seed a kid in his mother's milk. So the first fruits coming up uh, from the ground uh, as, as you harvest 
was supposed to be brought to the house of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, this is so important and it is brought out in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 48, verse 14. Notice what it says there concerning the first fruits. And they <laughs> shall not sell of it, neither exchange nor alienate the first mm. fruits of the land, for it is holy unto the Lord. The first fruit mm. is considered holy. And the people of Israel were to bring this to the house of the Lord. The lesson brings uh, something that I like to read at this point. It says, the offering of the first fruits was an ancient Israelite agricultural practice with deep religious significance. Significance. It was a sacred recognition of God as the gracious provider who had entrusted his servants with the land where the crops grew and were ready to be harvested. So this is a, uh, an acknowledgement that God is the one that gave the produce, the fruits of the land. Uh, here from the Desire of Ages, page 77, it says the Passover was followed by the seven, seven days feast of unleavened bread on the second day of the feast. The first fruits of the year's harvest, a sheaf of barley was presented before the Lord. All the ceremonies, listen carefully, of the feast were types of the work of Christ. The deliverance of Israel from Egypt was an object lesson of redemption which the Passover was intended to keep in memory. The slain lamb, the unleavened bread, the sheaf of first fruits represented the Savior. And here is why the Bible brings out uh, clearly that this was all a reference to Christ. And we're going to go into the New Testament in a moment here, but first we go to Deuteronomy chapter 26. Uh, we're going to just read a few verses, the actual... Um, passages, verses 1 through 11, but we're just going to read a few of those. And it says, And it shall be when you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you mm. as an inheritance, and you possess it and dwell in it, that you shall take some of the first of all the produce of the ground, which you shall bring in from your land that the Lord your God is giving you, mm. and put it in a basket and go to the place where the Lord your God chooses to make His name abide. And you shall go to the one who is priest in those days and say to him, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come to the country which the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. Then the priest shall take the basket of your hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord your God. It was to be brought as an offering to the Lord. Move down to verse 8. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm, with great terror and with signs and wonders. He has brought us unto this place and has given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now, behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land which you, O Lord, have given me. Mm. Mm -hmm. Then you shall set it before the Lord your God and worship before the Lord your God. So you shall rejoice in every good thing which the Lord your God has given to you and your house, you and the Levite and the stranger who is among you. This first fruits represented Jesus Christ. And it is beautiful as we go into 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Mm. There in verse 20, we begin reading, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now let's stop here for a moment and consider, well, Christ is the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. Question, was Christ the first one resurrected? Well, no, because we have the um, message of Moses being resurrected first, but Christ is first in uh, quality and status because mm. He is our Savior, our Creator. He is first in status and position, not the first resurrected because Moses was resurrected first. Now we continue reading 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 21. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. Jesus Christ has made possible the resurrection of the dead. His resurrection makes possible our resurrection. Mm -hmm. And verse uh, 22, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ, all shall be made alive. Praise the Lord. But each one in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, afterward, those who are Christ, when? At his coming. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those verses that helps us to understand that when you die, you don't go immediately to heaven. Mm -hmm. You have to wait for Christ to return because it says Christ the first fruits afterward those who are Christ at His coming. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. Now notice what Jesus says in John chapter 14 and verse 19. 
a little while longer and the world will see me no more. Mm. But you will see me because I live, you will live also. Mm -hmm. At that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. So the lesson that we have here is that Christ living a perfect life and offered himself as our sacrifice and then dying for us. And the fact that he rose from the dead is a testimony and a declaration that he as our high priest continues to work in the most holy place in heaven so that our sins can be totally blotted out mm -hmm. and so that we uh, have the blessing and privilege of salvation through Jesus Christ. And it may be that some of us that are alive today may one day die, mm -hmm. but the promise is that there is a resurrection mm -hmm. of the just. Good. And we hope you are in that one. I mm -hmm. hope to be in that one. If the Lord sees that I go to sleep, go to the grave, I will have the promise. I have the promise of being resurrected. And it says, Jesus says, because I live. He's talking to the disciples uh, even before his death. And he's making a proclamation. Mm. He says, a little while longer mm. and the world will see me no more. This is uh, specifically talking about his death. But then he says to them, but you will see me. Mm -hmm. And because I live, you will live also. Amen. At that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. The promise of Jesus was to bring them hope. The promise mm -hmm. of Jesus brings us hope. Mm -hmm. We understand from the scriptures that there is going to be a resurrection. Mm -hmm. And uh, we believe that Jesus Christ is coming soon. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, in the lesson something that I'd like to read to you as well. And uh, this is, um, it says here, according to Wayne Grudem, it says, in calling Christ the first fruits, which is the Greek word apar aparke, Paul uses a metaphor from agriculture to indicate that we will be like Christ. Isn't that powerful? Mm. Just as the first fruits or the first taste of the ripening crop show what the rest of the harvest will be like mm -hmm. for that crop, so Christ as the first fruits shows that our resurrection bodies will be mm. like when in God's final harvest, mm. he raises us from the dead and brings us into his presence. Hallelujah. I rejoice in that. Mm. Yes. Uh, and of course, this brings us into remembrance of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, yes. where it says this mortal shall put on immortality. We do not have immortality now. There's nothing in us eternal. We are perishing. Uh, every second that passes uh, is, you know, I remember hearing a song many years ago uh, that was, has a very powerful statement. We know that the moment that you're born is when you begin to die. You know, we, mm -hmm. we grow old little by little, mm -hmm. but the, the song doesn't say anything about the resurrection, but the Bible does, yeah. and we believe in it. I read to you now from 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, mm -hmm. that we should be called the children of God. Yes. Therefore, the world does not know us mm -hmm. because it did not know Him. Mm -hmm. Verse 2, beautiful, powerful. Beloved, now we are children of God, right. and it has, yet, it has not yet been revealed what we shall be like. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, yeah. for we shall see Him as He is. Mm. Praise the Lord. Uh, moving quickly to James chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of His own He uh, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits yes. of his creatures. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, the first fruits, and then us. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Thank you so much, Praise Pastor John and Jill, and Pastor James and Shelley. Thank you so much for your lessons. It's been such a, a great blessing. Uh, we've got just a couple of minutes. Let's get some final thoughts. I just didn't get to one point that I wanted to make, and that is the same men who were guarding Jesus' tomb, mm -hmm. when the angel came down and there was the earthquake and the angel rolled away the stone, those men trembled and fell as dead. Then they went in Matthew 28, they go to the leaders mm -hmm. of the Christian, uh, the, not Christian leaders, but the le religious leaders, 
and they want to silence him. They tell him to hush, give him money, say, just tell him that he was kidnapped from the mm -hmm. tomb. And that story still goes around today, but nobody would take a body from a tomb, unwrap it, and leave the linen cloths mm -hmm. folded. That's right. One thought from Isaiah, uh, Psalm 68, verse 18. We looked at Ephesians 4, verse 8, which talked about this <laughs> captivity that Christ led to heaven. Psalm 68 is where it's being quoted from. It says in verse 18, Thou hast ascended up on high, speaking of Christ. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast uh, received gifts from men, for men. That's the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then it goes on to say this, Yea, for the rebellious also that the Lord God might dwell among them. The gospel is not just for believers. The gospel is for the whole world. Amen. On Wednesday, we looked at witnesses of the risen Christ. And the truth of the matter is that when we witness him for ourselves, then God turns us into a witness for him to other people, as it talks about in Isaiah chapter 43. Amen. I want to go back to John chapter 14, verse 19. Jesus said to the disciples, a little while longer and the world will see me no more. And, and I would like to say to you, in a little while, we will see him soon. <laughs> and it says, because I live, you will live also. Because Jesus lives, we will live also. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 I serve a risen Savior. Amen. He's in the world today. Amen. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. That's the message. Mm -hmm. Jesus is alive. He is risen. Mm -hmm. Praise God that that tomb is no longer sealed and our Savior is with us. You got to join us next week because next week we're going to be diving into lesson number eight entitled The New Testament Hope. And my friends, this is just getting better and better and better. We thank you so much for joining us this week. And we hope to see you right back here next week for 3ABN Sabbath School Panel. God bless.